Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Mind Game. Mental Health Week is just kicking off, and we are crushing it with some great guests. Today, we're going to have uh, Alexa Ray Hirsch, my daughter, who's a college student. Uh, we're going to talk about youth mental health, parenting and mental health, things to look for, um, what it was like raising a child that has uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, as Alexa has obsessive compulsive disorder, as do I. But let's bring in Dr. Diane McIntosh, our expert on everything and uh she's been absolutely fantastic and she's co-hosting with me on this show and and uh, she's a, a psychiatrist and TELUS is neuroscience chief officer so we are uh blessed to have her and we're going to bring her in right now Ooh. hi diane hi How Corey. You? i'm well thank you to different every time <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, how are you doing? Everything uh, going okay? I know we were supposed to be on at 10 today, but we had to move it to noon as you had a little bit of a, an emergency that you had to tend to. So I thank everybody out there for, for waiting. And um, uh, just from yesterday to recap a little bit, uh, we talked a lot about masculinity, about resilience um, during this these times. And then we got into a lot of little other things right now. But um, you know, anything from yesterday that you uh, that you recall that uh, is important for today that we can just rehash before we start with Alexa? Well, I think it's great that Alexa's on today because I think we spent a fair amount of time talking about parenting and uh, the the job we have, which I think is one of the most important jobs that we have in the world, is to be a great parent and also to recognize that our children are not us that we are not them and that we have to allow them to be themselves. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that I hope will come out of our conversation today with, uh, with Alexa, just an understanding when your child has a mental illness, how as a parent we cope with that. Yeah, and uh, she's uh, doing extremely well. She's in college and, uh, and just knowing that, you know, what's when we interview her that, you know, that you're not, you don't have to be held back and uh, having an open family home and a lot of great things. So let's bring in, Alexa. Hey, Alexa. Hi. How are you? So I'm really a little bit nervous, but we're good. <laughs> you'll, you'll be absolutely fine. Um, now, Alexa is a, a fourth year college student, going to be a teacher. And when Alexa was about 15 or 16 years old, she came to me um, with something that was, she didn't know really what it was, but something that she felt was wasn't right. And we always talked about mental health in our homes because of what happened with me. Um, and we had an open home where you could always talk about your mental health with, with myself and feel safe. And it was a safe place. And I'm glad I did because Alexa was able to get therapy. Um, and she's in a much better place than I ever was when, when things started to happen to me. So um, I think today what we'll do is we'll let Dr. Diane McIntosh just mainly speak with Alexa. This is her area of expertise. And uh, I'll chime in uh, as I will. Um, and just give my uh, parenting advice on Alexa, and uh, we'll just go from here. So, Dr. McIntosh, uh, you know, what are your thoughts of parenting and and children, and you know, uh, having a safe place to be able to tell your stuff if something is going on? Well, I think this is a safe space for me to tell you to stop calling me Dr. McIntosh. Corey. Uh, I can <laughs> tell you. Diane on here. It, in this context, I'm Diane, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, okay. <laughs> Alexa, it's so nice to meet you. Nice and to my you. goodness, Corey, how did you create this beautiful <laughs> being? <laughs> she has a beautiful mother, so we're Ah, uh, there we go. So <laughs> we, that's a whole other uh, episode on how we uh, create <laughs> such <laughs> wonderful children. Um, Alexa, it's so nice to meet you, and and I'm thrilled to hear that you are successful at school and things are going well, despite the fact I'm that you have <laughs> because I think a lot of people have that idea that it, once you have a diagnosis, that's it, the doors start to close. Has that been your experience? Um, I think that just the fact that my dad came to me so early definitely helped me with just understanding that there was something wrong. You know, there is something that it's hard when you're young because you don't know what other people think. You don't know what other, how other people do things and you don't know, you know, how they go about their daily life and how they get work done and stuff. But for me, it was, things started coming up in my mind um, while I was doing schoolwork or whatever it was. And I just couldn't focus. And I think that's a hard 
thing for people to understand. And when other people don't think like you, it's like, what's wrong with me? You know? And I think that it was just the fact that my dad had talked to me so early was kind of helped me realize that that door wasn't shut. It just needed help, you know? And I think when you're 15, and you can correct me when I'm, if I'm wrong here, Alexa, because you're a little closer to that age than I, I am, uh, that when you start having things happen that feel different, you feel like you're the only person who has them or that, you know, everyone else seems to be fine and I'm not. And having a dad who's saying, no, I have this probably was helpful. Yeah, that's for sure. I mean, I've known at least for me, that's kind of how I felt. I've also known people who have struggled who didn't realize that not everybody thought that way. And I felt that way as well when I was younger too. Like, oh, like not everybody has these problems, you know? <laughs> like not everybody has struggles with not f being able to focus because their mind just won't shut off and um, whatever it may be. I struggled with counting specifically. I would count everything. like just my my breaths while I was learning how to drive I would count the street lights and obviously that's not focusing while you're driving um and I just didn't I also didn't know that not everybody struggled with those things right it's it, OCD I think is one of the greatest challenges to describe to other people and that I gotta say your dad blew my mind when I first met him that very first day he was at my book launch and I asked him there to speak a little bit about his life and his journey with mental illness and he was able to describe OCD in the most profound and uh, I think just clear way than anyone I had ever heard describe it before from from a life or living experience, right? It's one thing to have a clinician, a doctor tell you this is OCD. It's mm -hmm. quite another thing for someone to be able to talk about it the way that he did. And everyone in the room was leaning in, listening, wanted to hear what if and and please, Alexa, if you're not comfortable answering a question, I want you to be honest and, and upfront. I don't want you not to to I want you to make sure that we stay within your boundaries. But can you talk a little bit about for you what was OCD like? Oh <laughs> OCD for me has changed a lot over the years, which is also a really interesting thing about having this disorder. From when I was younger, it was very simple, but also you know, debilitating and things like school or, you know, I experienced a lot of guilt, I guess, when I would not be able to focus on certain things. There's just, there's a lot about it that like a lot of people don't understand. And it's kind of hard to talk about because it's like, just people don't understand it as much. So when I was younger, I would count things and I would um, count my steps, count my, which everybody kind of has their little like, obsessive things that they do or compulsive things that they do. And so when I would explain that, like, oh, I count my steps, people are like, oh, sometimes I do that on the sidewalk too. And to me, I was yeah. like, okay, like it's normal then. But for me, it was like, I would be having a conversation with a friend next to me and I did not remember the conversation I was having whatsoever. And that was frustrating because I would just be, you know, focused on whatever my OCD was telling me to do. I struggled a lot with fear. I, uh, you know, was, that's what the one thing my dad, I think, started noticing about me was that, you know, I couldn't, um, I couldn't go in the garage by myself. I still have trouble doing it sometimes. Like I just, just mentally, like there's just things, my anxiety just stops me from doing. Um, and that can definitely be stressful. School can be stressful when you're just so caught up in whatever your thoughts are telling you. And then you also have these responsibilities to get done. And that's been really difficult. Um, and then, but throughout the years, my OCD has changed a lot. And I think understanding how to deal with it has helped me a lot, where I got the information on how to deal with some of the things when I was maybe a freshman in high school, I believe. And that definitely helped me understand how to deal with things. But I had to also continue therapy because your anxieties change and your compulsions and obsessions can change. And I definitely struggle now a lot more with uh, social anxiety, which is something that's really weird for me because I have always been a very social person. 
But when OCD comes up into the picture and you say something and then you can't stop thinking about what you may have said or what you could have said or what you should have said or um, how it could have made someone else feel or whatever it is. And then, you know, that person has forgotten completely about what you said already. But for weeks on and on, I can still continue to think about this stuff just from having OCD. So I think that's what I mostly struggle with now. Yeah. For sure. So then, um, for me, like, so the, the, what in with my, my dynamic and Alexa's, um, we talked about mental health in the home, right? And my, my parents, their generation didn't learn anything. They didn't, they didn't know about mental health. Right. So when I look back to my story was, is that I can remember the day that, you know, everything kind of crashed on me and my brain just kind of broke. Right. But I didn't know to get help the next day. I didn't know what it was. Nobody did. I tried to talk to my parents. I tried to talk to anybody and I have wonderful parents. This is not, this isn't anything on them, but I spent the next three years in silence, in hiding. And then when I finally did get diagnosed, um, it was that much harder to, uh, you know, get better. So for Alexa, uh, just how important was it that she came to me in your eyes that the early diagnosis, getting treatment, and she has never yet, and I, and I don't think she will, get to that horrible place that I did. Um, just the speak to the you know importance of early diagnosis if you can massive so massive 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 first of all alexa i i wanted to make the point because you and your dad both on the same screen and your ocd is very different and so even though there is a familial or genetic component to ocd it looks different in every person. People have different obsessions, different compulsions. Some have only obsessions, some have only compulsions. And also people have different comorbid conditions. So comorbid means that you have more than one problem at once. So Corey, you've talked about having OCD, but having times of depression. So sometimes you can have OCD plus depression, plus social anxiety, plus ADHD, plus. So often these disorders co-occur, right? So it's, it's actually very rare that I meet someone that just has OCD. They often have a number of different challenges. What we know though, back to your point, Corey, is that uh, first of all, the earlier the onset of a mental illness, the more what, pernicious the course, or often the more severe the course. But your symptoms, Alexa, start at when most do. And most serious mental illnesses start in the teen years. That's the reality, is that uh, we're, our brain uh, starts to do some really critical wiring at that time. And so when that's when we tend to see OCD really first show itself. Um, schizophrenia, bipolar, it doesn't mean that all the, the root wasn't there already, but the onset or the when we start to see symptoms is in the teen years. The sooner that we can get help to kids that are struggling, uh, help them to understand I'm not alone, I'm not the only one who has this, that this is real and that I have to pay attention to it and get some support, the better. Because what you experience, Corey, very close to end it, your life. And that's not uncommon because when you start to have anxiety, which is horrible, anxiety is horrible. Your brain is consumed all the time. You think you're out there and weird. No one else is like me. It's not surprising that some people end up down the road of, I just need to end this. I can't live like this. I can't put this on my family anymore. And that is a, an outcome we need to try to prevent. Yeah. And so another thing too is, and I'll, I'll be blunt, Diane, you know, is it my fault that Alexa has obsessed. There's parental guilt to it, right? Like, like I, we all want to have the perfect child. I, I wanted to have the perfect. And Alexa, you are close to perfect. Child. I was going to say she looks pretty <laughs> darn perfect to me. <laughs> but then we take it on ourselves. Like, this is my fault. This is completely 100% my fault. Um, what do you say to parents out there that feel that way about you know? And it doesn't have to be OCD. It can be a child with anxiety or depression or like this is just you know my and Alexa's dynamic, but. It doesn't have to be OCD, but I know there's a lot of parental guilt out there when their child isn't perfect. Hate to tell you this, Alexa, but uh, parental guilt is, and it's just part of the game, <laughs> unfortunately. You got a kid, you're gonna feel guilty about something. But when they have a serious struggle in their life and we have the same struggle, man, that that's tough. So I just wanna lay this out there in as clear terms as possible. Every mental illness, 
has three root causes, biological, psychological, and social. The biological are things like genes, hormones, neurotransmitters. The psychological are, you know, some of us are more vulnerable. Some of us are, are more resilient. Some of us have better coping skills, uh, just our sort of temperament and our personality makeup. And then the social are my kids being dragged off to jail. I have a financial problem. I'm in the middle of a divorce. I, those big life crisis. I've got this, all these exams and, you know, the pressure at school is too much. There is no mental illness that we can go, Oop, that's because your mom, Oop, that's because your dad, Oop, that's because of this or that. It is a combination of all those things. So absolutely, Corey has OCD and you, part of your genetic makeup, that 50% of it, in fact, came from him, but it's also that the psychological and social factors that are important. And what a gift you are to the world that Corey and your mom decided to make you. And so a lot of parents are really worried if they have a serious mental illness, well, I don't want my kid to have this. But Corey was able to raise you in a way that you were able to step forward to your mom and dad and say, I'm not well, I need some help. And you didn't end up going down that same challenging road. So you have to share those gifts with others. Yeah, and, and just, you know, um, I just got a question that someone that a parent finds it's hard to control their own anxiety, trying to keep their own children from their anxiety. So the, the it's like, uh, you know, you're anxious because they're anxious. And then, so the, one of the biggest things as a parent, I think it's important to, sh to be a good role model. Uh, you got to take care of your anxiety yourself. Um, you got to eat well, um, you know, do the things and be a good role model and teach your child, you know, tactics that will help them. Um, you know, unfortunately for me, it was, I, I, it took me a long time to figure out OCD and what worked for me and, and medications and all that with Alexa, what's, what's so wonderful about it. And, and she still has tough days too. And, um, but we were able to, I think, cut down the time frame of, you know, of illness to recovery, uh, by probably, you know, one, one hundredth of what we had just because I knew where to go and what to do. And also that I could show her different ways to take care of her mental health that nobody taught me. So it's, there's a learning process there too, but, um, you know, Alexa, what is something you do today now to, uh, you know, to control or to help your OCD or to, um, you know, so that it doesn't, when it does get, um, you know, too much or whatever, what is something that you do that helps you? Well, um, I try to do like a, quite a few things. I mean, everything, you know, different situations are different. So there's never a certain way to handle every single situation, right? And like he, like my dad said, it was important for him to let me know the importance of like the different things that you can do, whether it's therapy, whether, whether it's medication, whether it's um, just taking care of your body in general. And what's been interesting with that is like growing up, I've been able to kind of take that into my own life and not necessarily follow every little detail that that worked for him you know just be able to make it my own and work for me and so for me like medication has definitely helped me in the last year or so and um you know that's something that's hard to talk about with people as well because it there's a stigma there's a stigma against it and i think for me i about a year ago came back to my dad and i i had been throwing up for like two days. I couldn't go to work. I was so stressed out because my anxiety was just at such a bad high that um, it just, my life was not working. Yeah, you're <laughs> and, yeah. yeah I was struggling I for about that. a week and my dad had to come to me, or that was probably about two years ago now. And my, I went to my dad and I said, look, well, this is what I'm dealing with. I don't know what to do. I haven't dealt with this in years. I don't know. It's hard because I knew what to do but at the same time, my brain wouldn't shut off because I'd been taught what to do. I'd gone to therapy. I'd done, you know, like I had learned what to do. But in this moment, my brain would just not let me use those things because these thoughts wouldn't shut off. And so my dad had to tell me, like, you've tried medication. Why don't you think about it again? You know, like come back to me in a week. And it was hard getting back on it, but I, it was something that, ultimately there it's not something to be ashamed of it's that there was something that was going on in my brain that isn't connecting that's what you know that's what happens and i 
had to do that. And then there's also other things that I do as well. Um, just taking care of myself and making sure that, you know, self-care. Yeah. Yeah. Alexa, I, I'd love to ask you a couple more questions around there, because I think that you, you hit the nail on the head. There's a lot of stigma about medication. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to come back to a point, Corey, that you made a few minutes ago about how your anxiety can help your kids to become anxious. Um, it, COVID-19 is not the only infectious disease that we're dealing with, right? Anxiety is infectious. So if you're not managing your anxiety, if you're afraid all the time, you can teach your kids to be afraid. And it's, I don't think there's an intention, I'm going to try to terrify my children, so they have this problem. But if you don't take care of yourself and model what, it, what to do, if you're struggling, your kids won't know that. And so you, we have to be aware that our kids, what we do is actually how they see the world. This is how they're going to interact. They're going to learn from us, from their teachers, but we're the most important influence in their life. Alexa, I am so grateful for you saying there's stigma for medication, but I went ahead and did it and I needed it because not everyone requires medication, but I would say OCD is the most challenging illness that I treat and that there are many patients that I see that really benefit from talk therapy, from cognitive behavioral therapy. But when you're really ill, some people need medication. And sometimes it's really complicated to find the right one. I see my job as a psychiatrist is to help to make the diagnosis, make sure that it fits with your experience, and then find the medication that works for you. We have tons of antidepressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers. They work. Every one of them works, but they don't work for everyone. So my job is to find out for your brain what works for you, what is tolerable. You don't have side effects, that so you don't mind taking it. That works to manage your symptoms. And the earlier we get that managed, the better. Yeah. And uh, Alexa, I'll flat out ask you, do you blame me for your OCD? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, I blame you too, Corey. No. Not at all. I mean, no. I I know that you've thought of it probably that way. And sometimes I wonder, like, you know, what would it be like to not have it? Oh, but yeah. no, I don't blame you. But I can't say that that isn't a question for myself for when I want to have children as mm -hmm. well. You know, if I'll struggle with the same thing, like, it's not something that I necessarily want to pass on, but at the same time, like, I'll know how to help them. And who knows if they'll even, you know, get it or not. Diane, what role does genetics play in, in mental health? So most people don't realize this, but we have two of, of the most heritable psychiatric illnesses. They are ADHD and bipolar. Those are the two most heritable psychiatric illnesses. So if I meet someone who has ADHD, one of the common questions I ask is who else in your family has this disorder? Because almost everyone will say, oh, yeah, my dad or my kid or my, you know, someone close to them. Uh, and, and bipolar is the same. So those are the two most heritable. But even as heritable as they are, they are still not 100% right? So that it we don't know. It, Huntington's disease is a good example of something that is 100% heritable. If you have the gene for Huntington's disease, you have the disorder. It is an autosom autosomal dominant disorder. You got the gene, you get Huntington's. Um, there's autosomal recessive disorders like CF, cystic fibrosis, where you have to have mom and dad both have a gene. And when they unfortunately get together and don't know that they both have the gene, the child has uh, cystic fibrosis, can have cystic fibrosis. Well, these disorders, psychiatric disorders, have what's called polygenic inheritance. And that means there's probably a bunch of different genes. And most recently, we learned in ADHD, it looks like there's 12 critical genes. And so, Alexa, you got some of those from your dad, but you probably also got some from your mom too, because it's a mix, right? 50% of your genetics came from your mom and 50% from your dad. And you notice you don't look exactly like your brother or sister because everyone gets a different 50%. That's why unless you're a, an identical twin, you have the same DNA. I just like to highlight, however, that identical twins are also very different because they live in different environments. That's the psychosocial part of it, right? So genetics are important, but in mental illness, they're only a piece of it. And some of what you got from your dad and some of what you got from your mom went into making you Alexa, who has OCD. If you meet a lovely person that you'd like to make babies with someday, 
that your child is going to have 50% from you and 50% from him. And that little combo is maybe going to have uh, end up with a child who has OCD, but also someone who may have red hair and, and purple eyes. I don't know that you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Look at the gift that your father has given to the world by having OCD, by having this experience and going and telling other people it's okay not to be okay. So I look at it from the perspective of, we all got shit in our lives, things are gonna happen. Mm -hmm. How do we change the outcome for ourselves and for others? And and your dad is living proof and I'm sure Alexa, you're gonna be the same. Uh, Alexa, um, very well said, Diane, I won't call you Dr. McIntosh anymore. But, <laughs> um, just trying to describe how important it was for you to be in a family that you were able to come to a parent uh, that when you were struggling with your issues, um, and could you imagine today if you still weren't able to tell somebody or to get help, like how important was that to you as a 15 year old child to be able to come to a parent and say, Hey, I'm struggling. I think that it was probably, it probably is the most important thing just about my story in my life, like in the way that I've handled OCD. I still remember the first conversation that you had with me on um, just everything. I think I was in like fifth grade and I don't know if you had started noticing things about me or whatnot, but he basically came to me and he was like, look, if you, you know, ever feel this way and he didn't necessarily go into every detail or anything, but just putting it out there and making it, making me aware of it was something that just made me think that I could even go to him because you don't like, he wasn't a helicopter parent about it. He wasn't telling me like, Oh, are you feeling this way? Or like, how are you feeling today? Or like, what are you, what are you doing today to help yourself? Or, you know, just, and it wasn't like he was always on top of me about it. It was just that he made it, made me aware that I could talk about it. Yeah, I and I am, I am a great parent, I will say. I am you're, you're fantastic. <laughs> no, but you're right. I just left it open-ended that if something was going on in your brain, to just come talk to me, that I wasn't going to judge you. Yeah. Uh, and that I would listen and that we would figure it out together, right? So, uh, Diane, what's – and just for you, how important it is when you have parents that are supportive of you know some of your patients – it's, it's everything really. I think that, um, I think the other side of that is the, the young people that I see whose parents don't believe that there's anything mm -hmm. wrong and mm -hmm. is how devastating that is. And what you did, Corey was just right. First of all, you have no idea what was going on in Alexa's head. She didn't even know what was going on in her head. So no. it's not like you could go, <laughs> I have a feeling you're counting. Are you counting? Yeah. Like you would not know what was going on. And, but in an age appropriate way saying, you know, if you're ever worried about what's happening inside your head, some of your thoughts, you can always talk to me. And, uh, you know, I have two kids, uh, 23 and 18. And I still say to them now when I know they're worried about something, it's always better out than in. And so you know that every time we talk about a worry, it feels better on the other side. And they go, OK, you're right. And then they'll, they'll tell me, you know, when your kid is worried, but making sure that it's age appropriate. Alexa, I wanted to ask you about, and I'm, I'm just going to give everyone some horrible statistics. I'm sorry to do this, but the, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., the CDC, came out with the statistics for youth suicide over um, from 2007 to 2017. They increased 57%. So this is unheard of. And so we know that we have a mental health crisis and we have a suicide crisis amongst youth, and that would be from 10 to 24. And my my question for you is around the impact of life as a young person right now and social media is my belief is there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of guns in the US, this is true. And there's also issues with um, you know, overdose, that kind of thing. But the C CDC docs didn't really know how to explain this massive increase. And my concern is that part of it is social media, that we're doing a big experiment with our children's brains. But I, I wondered from the perspective of someone who is in that age group, what are your thoughts on that? I think uh, for me, social media started becoming really big around the time that I was probably developing my brain mostly. And I think that as far as just everything that comes around social media is how you're using it. And unfortunately for a lot of youth, 
platforms, they're, it's being used as a way to spread fear and a way to spread um, jealousy. I think that's a big thing uh, is just you get to see how everybody else lives their life perfectly on social media and how everybody else's lives are, their families get them this things, these things, and they get to go this place. And, you know, then you have the kids that are sitting in their homes on their phones, can't get out of bed because um, they could be struggling with something. And this is all they're doing all day long is scrolling through. And so even if it's, I, I think it just, it not only has to do with things like, you know, guns in the U.S. and whatever it may be to spread fear, it's a lot of it revolves around, you know, self-pity. Not self-pity, that's that's not mm. necessarily the word to go about it, but... Um, self-image and... Yes, yeah, mm. self-image, and it can be really hard for people, I think, who don't understand that not everyone's lives are as perfect as they look on social media and it can be definitely no hard no, no one's lying exactly. so, it, people lie on social media and i wish oh people yeah. would understand right? Corey, i've seen you in that bathing suit with life. the cocktail and the, yeah, come on <laughs> we know that's a <laughs> well, and and a lot of um it's not only social media you know it's a lot of the tv shows we're watching and a lot of the movies that we're watching you know I didn't really have the option when I was in middle school to binge watch a series on Netflix. Like it was go home and watch TV on the couch with your brother, like Disney Channel or something, you know, whereas now kids have access to everything, things that their minds can't really comprehend yet. And they might comprehend things in many different ways. And I think that can be really stressful as well, because shows even affect me if I watch like something a little too scary for too long, like. You know, afterwards you feel like you're in the show. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, I'm living this life in so the handmade. Yeah. <laughs> so how do we how do we how do we change that, Diane? Like how do what do we need to what do we need to do to help these kids? I think we need to be parents first and foremost, which is that we have to have boundaries and 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 create rules around social media. So if you look at the Canadian Pediatric Society says no screen time for under two that we know that uh, screen time has an impact on your brain structure and functioning, and they recommend no screen time under two. And then uh, as kids get a little bit older, that we limit the screen time to two hours. And, and you have to think about that cumulatively, because if you're in the minivan, so your parents are getting dressed, so you're watching something, and then you're in the minivan on the way to school, and you've got screen time, and at a school, they have something on. And then in the grocery store on the way home, you're on the, the iPad, look, you can end up spending six hours a day on screen time for little kids. For older kids, talking about this, what you just talked about, Alexa, that you're watching other people's lives, teaching them about critical thinking. Okay, what evidence do you have that that's actually what's happening in their life? Why are all these celebrities getting divorced if they're so joyfully happy all the time? You know, and and the having these, you know, the the outbursts and that are caught on film. If everyone is so joyfully happy, why why are we hearing all this other stuff that's actually happening? These are all human beings and they're putting out a story that's not real. And I can't agree with you more about brains watching things before they're ready. I remember a couple of years ago, my son watched a stoning on TV okay. or on online. And I told him, please don't watch before that please don't watch stuff like that because you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just like watching TV. It isn't because you yeah. know that's a real person. And I, I think it took him, honestly, a couple of years to overcome yeah, that, the distress of watching that human experience. And kids can get and see everything now. Parents yeah. need to be aware of what they're doing and talk to them about how that can harm your brain. Yeah. Um, and Alexa, I mean, it's just just to ask you too. So, I mean, you're right in university and, and college and that. What can we do for your generation as adults um, to help you guys? Like, what, what can we do? Can we, can we educate you guys more in school? Can we have more programs? Can we, you know, what do you see where you're at that we could do better as adults for you guys for mental health? It's a good question because I think that one thing that can definitely be done is just the understanding that no matter how small the situation is, anything can be talked about with someone. Um, I've had a lot of friends who have dealt with things that, 
you know, I've said, why don't you go talk to a professional, you know, because that's always what I've known is mm -hmm. to go talk to a professional or someone who can really help me. And, you know, it's like, well, it's not that serious, you know, like it's not, it's not that big of a deal. And it's like anything that gives you anxiety and debilitates your day and makes you, you know, takes away a day from you, basically, it's because your thoughts won't stop thinking about it or whatnot, like, anything like that can you can go to a professional about and so i think it's just not necessarily sharing um well of course we need to raise awareness for every situation like there's bigger trauma than you know there's a lot of big things going on in the world right now and a lot of things happening to people but you know like things like going to a party and not remembering things or whatever it may be like a lot of college students struggle with that stuff or you know someone said something to you that really bothered you or whatever it may be like just just knowing that a professional person is available to talk no matter what the situation is you didn't have to go through an, a huge trauma traumatic experience to go talk to someone i think that's kind of where I think of things, you know, because I think because of my experience with getting help and talking to professionals, I learned things about myself that I would have never have thought about before. And so even going and talking to a professional about something that is super small to in your eyes, that like, you know, you've had anxiety for the past two days about a test, go talk to a professional about it. And you might learn things about your childhood that you had no idea what to do. Like, you, you know, like just, Stuff like that, like you just don't know, like if you connect with a person and you might not connect with every single psychiatrist or therapist in the world, like that's something mm. to be known as well. But just to know that professional help is available. Yeah. Diane? That's a, a great point that you ended with too, Alexa, is that if you have a therapist that you're seeing or you're, you're referred to a therapist or to a psychiatrist and there isn't a fit, that's okay. I think any therapist or psychiatrist that's worth their weight will say, I want you to feel connected. I want you to be comfortable with me. And if you're not comfortable, if this is not a good fit, let's try to find you someone else who is a good fit. We can't all be loved by everyone, right? And I, I do recommend because everyone's a little bit anxious, maybe with the first visit that you give it a couple of shots and see maybe it was a just a bad day. But if you're trying to connect with someone and you feel like they just don't get me, uh, they don't understand or I just their style isn't right for me. Cool. Move on. Yeah. And that 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 should first of all, you shouldn't worry about that from a professional perspective. That person will be OK. And and second of all, the most important thing is that you get what you need. And if it's not going to work, move on, because there's always someone who will be OK with you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I'll just add to to uh, that. I, I think we're in a much better place than when when I was, uh, you know, your age. But I still think we can do so much more and, and, and we can do so much more for our youth. Um, we have to put a dent in those in those youth suicide statistics. And, um, you know, Diane, and I'll just show this because I, I, I took it off today. But that, that's, you know, those are the numbers we have. You know, that, that, those are the numbers today I'll put out by the CDC uh, and it's skyrocketing. It's uh, that's 2017, and I guarantee you, 2020, it's gotten worse, right? Yeah. So here's another chart that you know suicides have gone up, you know that that 24.8 percent as compared to other causes. Um, you know, so we're so worried about our children getting into car accidents or, or whatever it may be, but you know, <laughs> let's be honest, like it, it's it's very sobering to understand that that your child probably has a better uh, chance of, 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 you know, making an attempt at their own life than they are at, at, at getting, you know, something that else that we worry about, you know, so, so we need to be there for them. And that's how we're going to put a dent in it is by our parents knowing that, you know what, um, I need to worry about my child's mental health first and foremost, because A, that'll help them make decisions, good decisions along the way. B, uh, you know, if there is something wrong, early diagnosis is key. We can nip it right in the bud and see it's going to make them better people in the long run, uh, more compassionate people, more, uh, more kind. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just so important. And we really need to put a dent in that statistic because I always feel, Diane, and you can speak to this, but every child that takes their own life between the ages of 10 to 24 or even human being, we've failed them as a society. Uh, we, we really have. And, and I feel that, um, 
there's so much more we can do if we can get to that age group um, and teach them, you know, early, get them early diagnosis, maybe in their 40s, like the middle-aged men's, uh, our suicide rates are off the chart too. So, you know, if we can get to people early, you know, maybe we can put a dent in that and work with our youth. Well, Alexa, you probably remember in school, I don't know where, did you go in school, where did you go to school in Arizona? For the most part. Yeah, so I don't know what kind of education you have there, uh, but in, in Canada, most kids start le learning about sexuality, uh, about yeah. being a good person early, on, you know, there there's a lot of education in that area, but I don't think that we do nearly a good enough job of teaching about mental health. And, and using in an age appropriate way, but that it's okay not to be okay. And what does it mean to be, uh, what does stress mean? Because, you know, lots of parents will say, ah, oh, I'm stressed out. What does that mean? And when, it, when does it become anxiety? When does a mental illness actually become a real illness? Because there's lots of us who are stressed or have some anxiety, but when does it actually become a diagnosis? Well, in order to be diagnostic, you actually have to have functional impairment. You can't be able to do the things you normally do, like being functional at school or at work. So we need to give kids a vocabulary in school uh, so that they're able to talk to their parents or peers and say, I'm having trouble. But also to what Corey's point about just, you know, I, I'm sure you would have loved it if your dad had come to you and said, what's going on in your head? Tell me everything that's going on. I want to know versus being able to, to say on a regular basis, what, what's going on? Tell me a little bit about your day. Oh, I don't ask my kids anymore. I haven't for forever. What was your, you know, how are you? How was your day? Because I get fine. So tell me about your day. Who, who did you see? What was the best part about your day? That allows your kids to start talking to you about everything. And honestly, sometimes I learn more than I want to know, but I always want them to be able to talk to me. And that happens by starting right at day one, as soon as you can with saying, tell me all about your day. I want to, I want to know what's going on. Is that sort of what happened with Corey? It sounds like, Alexa. Yeah, I mean, yes, in ways. <laughs> um, he did a good job of trying to reach out for me to me when um, he was away on trips and stuff like that, for sure. Um, but I think a lot of it for me was a lot of teachers um, that helped me out as well. I think that that was really important to me, and that's kind of partially why I'm becoming a teacher, um, just because they saw that I had potential, but I struggled in ways. And so I remember when I was really young, something that like I would have never realized was debilitating when I was young, but you know, like I would, everybody would be halfway done with their assignments and I'd still be erasing and rewriting my name. And those are things to like for teachers to notice. And actually OCD is not one of the ones that, I'm not sure if it's because it doesn't come up as much until later in life, but it's not one of the ones that's talked about as much in school as ADHD or PTSD or um, other disorders are talked about. And so that's definitely something that I wanna be able to bring light of. Um, but definitely, yeah, just being there, you know, how are you doing or how was your day? And um, yeah, you might get the answer fine, but it's something. You gotta you know, go in for more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just being open, just being someone that, is safe to talk to right that's that's the key yeah that's, well that's what i did with with diane and, and i'm i'm i made tons of mistakes as a parent i know i'm still you're right i'm still uh but you know the one thing that i am proud of is, is that i gave them the safe feeling that they could come tell me anything that i wasn't going to judge them that i was going to listen to them and that we would get them help and we still talk about that today that you can come to me with anything like um, you know, and, and part of that I learned was because of what I went through, right? And I had great parents. I could talk to my mom about anything. Uh, my dad came from a different kind of generation. So, the, but my mom was very open and, and my dad was still loving. Shout out to my I grandma. Was, you know, <laughs> I love I you. <laughs> but it could be, maybe if you're, you, you don't know, and that's why it's so important to, to let people know, because it could be a teacher. It could be, a, a, a you know, a teammate. If you're on a team, it could be, uh, you know, an adult or, or whatever, just you don't know um, where someone's going to need help and where they look for it. So being open and just letting people know that you're a safe person to talk to, um, you know, that's what's what what I tried to do as a parent. And it's made all the difference because so look at me. Right. I, I And I'll use this as an example. I mean, I almost took my life because of this. Right. Um, and and that was 
because I, I never learned anything. I never learned anything in school. I never learned, uh, it was just not talked about. There was a stigma to it, right? And then you look at my daughter who has the same struggles that I do, but the difference is, is that we were able to have a safe, open conversation and learned about mental health. So hopefully you never get to that place, Alexa. If you do, I would hope that you talk to me, but that's the importance of being open and making a safe place for your children without judgment. And who gives a shit what the neighbors think, right? It's not about the neighbors. It's about having a healthy child. It's about your child's well-being. And I see children suffering like you do, Diane, because the parents are, are worried about, well, what if somebody knows that little Johnny's on medication? Or, or what if somebody knows that little Johnny's got OCD and he's not perfect in his head? Well, your child is suffering, right, all the while. And why would we let our child suffer for the sake of what somebody else thinks? I would never do that to anybody. So, um, you know, and that's a bit harsh reality, but that's the truth. And it, to me, it's about having an open, safe place for a child to come to. Uh, Alexa, you know, with having OCD, the challenges of seeking perfection, uh, having things just so is a pretty big part of OCD we should not be putting that on our kids or on our students. And so I think you'll be inspirational as a teacher. We all are because of our journeys and what we've learned in life. And if you can use what was probably a very rough journey at some points in time uh, for good rather than evil, and it sounds like you are, then you're gonna make a difference in so many lives. So I really appreciate that you're being as open as you are. I hope that you'll consider being a leader on the mental health front as far as trying to disseminate this kind of information and push for more education, uh, getting kids to have a vocabulary, teaching them as part of the vocabulary about mental illness. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I just think a lot of it is just learning what works for you, you know, like what, what can help your mental health? Like my church and my faith has helped me in so many different ways. And, um, you know, other things help other people. And I just think that it's just all of it's important to you know, raise awareness for. And I hope that I can help others as well. I'm so glad you brought that up because so often I get accused of being a pill pusher. And yes, that is one of my jobs is, is medication. Uh, but talk therapy is important. But you bring up another critical point. And I know Corey and I have talked about this previously as well. Exercise has value and actual evidence. It grows brain cells. It's a treatment for depression and anxiety. So faith, if you have a faith, then it can be extremely helpful in helping you to get through uh, a difficult time. So there are some things that yeah. have have evidence, research or scientific evidence, but other things that, you know, we don't have all the evidence, but we know that people who have faith, people who have a pet, you know, there's, there's different yeah. things that people find valuable. And for me, a lot of it with, uh, with medication, I've told my dad in the past, you know, he doesn't, he's, this is how I've been able to do it my way, kind of like he, has told me like, maybe you need to up your medication or maybe you need to do, you know, like, and he's great for telling, uh, giving me the resources and allowing me to be comfortable with that. For me, I've told, you know, everyone, like I'm on an extremely low dose because I like that I'm able to control my thoughts, but I also am able to uh, use other resources. So like my faith or exercise or whatever it may be, that works for me. And yeah you know, more things may work for other people. And so it's just, you know, yeah, exactly. Like finding out what works for you, the exercises are, is things that are um, scientifically proven. And there's other things that may not be, but they work for you. So essentially, yeah, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm, not, I'm not very religious as a person. I, I believe in a higher power. I believe in whatever's out there, but um, you know, her faith is, is wonderful. And it's, uh, it got her through a lot of tough times. And, uh, faith isn't a cure for OCD. <laughs> you know, religion isn't going to cure my OCD, but it's a it is a wonderful thing. It's gratitude. It's it's having a belief in in something that's bigger than us out there. And it, I, don't, I even if you're atheist, I, I don't I don't care. I, I'm here to listen. I'm here to help. I I don't I don't judge anybody. But use what 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 works for you. What's good for you. Uh, and faith is a wonderful tool uh, for Alexa. I know. So um, you know that's that's how I view things. 
Corey, you make that point, and I know I said it yesterday, you can't yoga your way or yogurt your way out of a severe mental illness. Uh, often you need medication and talk therapy has a ton of evidence. But I just like to put this little um, mental health pearl out there. Saying to someone you love, I think you may need to up your medication usually goes over somewhat like a lead balloon. Maybe <laughs> don't say that to anybody. Yeah. I would say that's the number one thing that people say. I hate it when, she's, I hate it when he says, Maybe you need did you take your medication or um, do you think maybe you need an increased dose? Really, do, people don't like that. <laughs> He's my dad and he's got it. <laughs> uh, Alexa, um, thank you for being on. You, you've been absolutely wonderful and, be, and so brave for being open and honest and uh, just having a great conversation. And I know this is going to help a ton of people out there. Um, so we're going to say goodbye to you right now, Alexa, Dr. Uh, Diane McIntosh. Diane and I will chat. <laughs> so first. nice to meet you, Alexa. Alexa. Thank you. We're going to chat about you without you in the room. How's that? <laughs> but thank you. Talk Alexa. Crap. I love you. Thank you so much. You're going to help so many people and um, just very proud of her. And she's done a wonderful job. So Diane, any thoughts? Thanks, Alexa. So nice to meet you. Go change the world. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Uh, so that's uh, you know that's my daughter, and uh, wow, uh, she struggles with OCD as well at times, and she's you know what a what a I couldn't ask for a, a better you know well spoken child, and she's been incredible, and um, you know she really wants to do more in the world of mental health because she sees that it's necessary and needed, and uh, you know and she's just done a fantastic job. I couldn't be more proud of her. Corey, can I ask you, because I I struggled with this myself. I've traveled mm -hmm. a lot. I'm away a lot. Yeah. And uh, I know you as a professional player were away an awful lot as well and are now. How do you how do you cope with that? You know, she, Alexa brought it up as saying, you know, dad was away, but I knew mm -hmm. he was there. What what what's that like hearing about that now? Well, so I, I, I do have a lot of regrets, Diane. I'm not going to lie. Um, there's, I, I wish I would have been in, in contact more with them. I wish I would have, there's things that I don't, I don't, that I missed. Um, and we're living in a world today where you, it's global, like people travel for work. So looking back, um, in hindsight and hindsight is a wonderful thing, but, um, I probably would have spent, you know, we didn't, I didn't have as FaceTime and all that when they were, when they were little and all that, I probably would have spent more time. Uh, nurturing, you know, just the day-to-day -day communication when I was away, FaceTime, um, all those things. Um, and and also, you know, making sure that your marriage is strong because that's important, um, you know, for your children. And I'm divorced and and I didn't make sure that my marriage was strong enough and that, that's on me. So there are things that I do have regrets about um, for my children, but as you can see by just being open and letting them know that they could always come to me and just having a dialogue and just letting them know that you're a safe person to talk to, um, it, you know, really keep, keeps those communication lines open. And that's probably the most important thing. Even if you're away, you can still pick up the phone. You can still FaceTime. You can still text. And there are days when I was like, um, you know, the last thing I want to do is, is watch my five-year-old draw for four hours, right? <laughs> but even if it's two minutes, just say hello, make contact, make connection. It means the world to them. Yeah, Corey, I think uh, it. we all struggle with guilt. We do mm -hmm. as parents. And, yeah, and uh, yeah. the what I try to do, because I really hate regret, it's not one of those things that I just find gives me nothing. <laughs> it doesn't give anything back. It just makes me feel terrible. And that's part of living in the minute moment and, mm -hmm. and trying to be mindful, which is a skill you can learn, is just to, to say, how can I make this day and this relationship better from here on? And that that's really what I try to do, rather than focusing on how, how did I screw up before and what was the wrong thing that I did? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important as part of that to figure, forgive yourself. Oh, uh, Forgiveness is one of those gifts I give myself. Uh, you you forgive not for the other person, right? When you forgive someone else, the real gift is that you don't carry around that weight anymore. So I really see forgiveness as a as a gift that I give myself that allows me to kind of move forward. 
but I had to, in order to learn how to do that, I also had to forgive myself for the failings, yeah. for not being there when, for some things that I wish I had been, because none of us are perfect. And we shouldn't try to pretend that we should be or could be. That's a lot to put on your kids because, you know, they think, well, if you're perfect, then I have to be perfect. We don't. And I think the way that you, you learn to own your mistakes, it's really hard. I remember when I was little saying to my son or my daughter, uh, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I didn't like doing it. I felt like I was a, a little bit of a failure for having to say that, but I got better at it because I had to say it all the time. Uh, the more you admit that you're human and your kids will recognize, yeah, I'm going to make mistakes, but my most important learning here is to own them and then move forward. Yeah. And, and try to, and try to improve, right? That's all we can do. And, and, and that's Diane, you, you're, you're a psychiatrist. You've, you've, you've done incredible things for mental health. You've done incredible things with your life. Um, I, I was blessed to play in the NHL, the Olympics, uh, all this stuff. So I would, I would just say this, that I have guilt about my parenting, right? And I need to forgive myself. Um, you know, just because you're successful at, at one thing or another, or you're a psychiatrist that's done, or a hockey player, or whatever people deem as, you know, being, uh, we're just like anybody else, right? We have regrets with our children. We have, uh, wish we could have done everything better, but I'm not perfect. I'm going to try to do my best to, to learn from that and move forward. And I'm going to try to forgive myself for those things. Um, and just, you know, I, I have a chance. My children are still, you saw my daughter, what a, a, a well-rounded, great person that she is. Um, and just, you know, try to be better in different ways and try not to miss those things anymore or whatever. I can't have those back. I can't. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's something we have to accept. The things that we did in the past, and we all now and again have that, oh, God, <laughs> did I do yeah. that or did I say that? We all do. So no all one's wrong. Nobody's wrong. You just have to say, you know what? I'm just not going to go back there anymore. I'm moving forward. But what are the things that I didn't like about myself and how can I change them? Just to get back to our discussion and the last two that we had, the only human being on earth you can control is you. But man, can you control you? You can yeah. control your thoughts, you control your feelings, and you can control your behavior. But it's a skill. And so when Alexa's saying, you know, find someone to talk to, that is the essence of cognitive behavioral therapy, a kind of talk therapy, is learning how to identify your thoughts, change them, and change your behavior. And you, you can absolutely do that. If those are, if you have thoughts that are really upsetting or distressing or just don't make any sense, you can actually learn to identify them. It feels very concrete at the beginning and a little bit difficult, but it becomes just part of you over time. And, and with that, Diane, we're almost at an hour. Wow, did that fly by? I'll, I'll let you have the last word because that was very, very well said. Um, thank you to Alexa. Uh, she was wonderful. Thank you to you, uh, Diane. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow I have a good friend on many. His name is Glenn Metropolit. He played for the uh, Montreal Canadiens uh, uh, with me in Washington. His story is incredible. He was an inner city kid in Toronto that really lived in the projects of Toronto. Uh, and somehow out of that made the National Hockey League, the resilience and strength that he showed. And his story is incredible. So we look forward to that tomorrow. Um, I will post the time and everything as we go. But Diane, thank you so much for today. You were wonderful again, as always. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Alexa. Bye.